welcome back. If I did a, a normal introduction to my special guest this week, I would be spending the next 35 minutes doing the introduction. So I'll try and keep it as, as brief as I can and get the salient points out. Uh, he's a man who started training in the early 1970s, and last night at Cork he trained yet another promising, exciting stakes winner. The progress in between times has been nothing short of extraordinary. Consider this. In the year 2000, he passed the record for most amount of winners ever trained in Ireland. That was 19 years ago, and he sailed on serenely past 3,000 winners and 4,000 winners subsequently. He's employed some of the greatest jockeys in the game. He's trained some brilliant horses. He's had champion stayers, middle distance horses, champion sprinters as well. Not only that, he became the first European-based trainer to win a leg of the American Triple Crown and remains the only one so to do. And he also opened the floodgates for horses, completely changing the shape of one of the world's most famous races in the race that stops Australia, the Melbourne Cup, by winning it with Vintage Crop and then a decade later with Media Puzzle. I think that does it for the time being, but there is so much more. Dr Dermot <laughs> Weld, welcome to Luck on Sunday. Thank you. I'm very embarrassed before I go any further. But the point is, and I think maybe the most salient point of all of that, is that having started training in the early 1970s, mm -hmm. in your early 20s, yeah, you trained a, a stakes winner last night at Cork and your ambition for this game burns and burns and burns and yeah. burns. Why so? Uh, because I enjoy it so much. Because obviously I have a lot of determination, a lot of enthusiasm, and basically I enjoy what I'm doing. Was there ever any doubt that, that this was what you were going to do? I know you have the veterinary qualification, but this just seems so within you, yeah. the business well, of training racehorses. You know, my mother and father <clears throat> were very, very successful trainers mm. together. And uh, when my father held the license, it was a team effort. So from a very young age I was involved, I was leading Amateur of Ireland a couple of times and rode winners kind of all over the world as an amateur and then qualified as a vet at 21 and started training, I think I was 22. How did it feel to be training at such a young age or because you'd grown up in it, did it, did it not feel like a, a big deal? Because I'd grown up in it, it didn't feel a big deal if you know what I mean and I'd been riding, I rode my first winner at 15 in Galway and uh, it, it, so I was in action from a very, very young age. I know in those days I was especially young because nowadays it's not so different. But um, yeah, I didn't. I never felt the pressure. I always, um, always had confidence, and um, look forward to it. I mean, you are a naturally confident person. I don't mean a gung ho person, but whenever I speak to you, you have a, mm -hmm. you have a great sort of inner. In a belief, a belief in yourself, a belief in your own ability. Where did that come from? What, who imbued you with that, do you think, mostly? I, I think it came from my mother. Um, she was a very, very confident lady. She was a brilliant person, very hard worker. Uh, I often said in my, my youth, I didn't have very much, but I didn't want for anything. So I think it was from my mother that I got this um, sense of, of confidence and hard work. And, and self-belief, belief, belief self -belief. that anything you set your mind to is possible. Most definitely. And is that where you think you got your sort of buccaneering spirit from? Yeah, I suppose so. There was always a, I always was interested in travel, and um, hence the reason I suppose I went around the world on a student ticket in the very early days uh, after I qualified as a vet, and uh, yeah, the training came on from that. But it was a happy upbringing. Very happy, very fortunate, wonderful parents. And and tell me a little bit about family life in the early days. Well, it was tough because we didn't have many horses and uh, prize money was very, very low. And uh, you, you, you achieved by very hard work, long hours, dedication, and a lot of things haven't changed. <laughs> so you got your, your ticket to go abroad, and where was the first stop? First stop was America, and from there to Australia, South Africa, back again. What was the most instructive period of that, of uh, that, uh, of that time? I would possibly say when I worked for Tommy Smith in Australia uh, was the most interesting and fascinating time and learning from the great man and working. I worked for him in the mornings and then from a vet called Percy Sykes, uh, who was the, the, he was the doyen vet of Australia, working for him in the afternoons. And uh, that was fascinating because they were two of the most brilliant people ever involved in the horse industry. Tommy Smith, uh, father of, of Gay Waters, yes, of course, was yes, on the show a few weeks ago, and her admiration for him sort of shining through so mm -hmm. strongly. You talk about taskmasters and people yeah. who could get the best out of horses and people. Have you ever met anybody like that subsequently? You meet 
in life, in the horse business, you meet so many, many wonderful and great people and interesting people. But I think Tommy Smith was, was right up there. Give me, give me a flavour of him as a character. <laughs> people always talk about him, and I imagine somebody, having never met him, known him, yeah. seen him, imagine someone of immense charisma. Huge charisma, but huge confidence in his own ability, and, uh, led by example, and a very, very, very hard worker. And um, seven day weeks, didn't matter, but also determination to succeed. And what was Australian racing like then? We see it freely now and it's on mm. all the time, we can watch it whenever we want. What was it like in, in those days? I suppose days? prize money wasn't as good then as it is now. Uh, the jockeys were very good then, they still are, but I think that was a vintage period. Mm. Uh, you had a lot of great riders there. But uh, it has changed, like world racing has changed so dramatic since I started training. That's for me is the interesting thing, is to see the changes, the progress that I always expected would happen. I always saw that world racing wouldn't be confined to Australia or Europe or America or Asia, that racing would become, what well, I use the word, internationalized. And I think that's where I played my small part, mm. tiny part, in a course when Vintage Crop won my first Melbourne Cup that uh, it was beginning, it, it, it drew the different countries together. And I never saw the world, <laughs> maybe as big as it is, I always saw that the world uh, was always possible to, for horses to race all over the world. And what happened in years to come, and of course, is happening now. I mean, this is a vintage crop in, in the 93 Melbourne Cup. I, I, I've sensibly taken the decision to remove the commentary from this race where, <laughs> say, and the, the cup goes back to England, England which is yeah. an immediate way of alienating an entire <laughs> continent. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I always felt for the poor commentator <laughs> at the time. But of course, we had planned that for over a year. and huge Because he'd been entered the previous year, hadn't he? He'd been entered the previous year and he'd been handicapped the previous year. He won uh, a good mile and six handicap in Tralee for me and Michael just said to me this is our horse for because I discussed with Michael Canaan the, the possibilities of bringing him to win a Melbourne Cup with him. He said this is our horse to win the Melbourne Cup and we entered him and uh, of course it wasn't he was handicapped but it wasn't possible to bring a horse to race in Australia then uh, because of the quarantine problems and the flight path of the planes had to be changed because you couldn't land on the African continent because of the danger of African horse sickness, so we had to go via North America. And then, of course, there was no quarantine facility where you could exercise a horse. So all that had to be changed. So it took about a year to do that. It took a lot of work with Canberra, with the veterinary department in Canberra, with Brussels, and eventually uh, we got the green light for go. And how excited were you? I mean, how, did it feel like a fantastic adventure? Oh, it did. It did indeed. And, and uh, like all adventures, there was ups and downs and there was moments when it might never have happened. And very quickly, one of them happened at the very beginning. When uh, we'd fog, he had to fly from Dublin to London to pick up with the Cathay Pacific flight to bring him to Melbourne. And we'd fog came in Dublin. And there was a specific time he had to go on that Sunday. We cut it very, very fine. And if he didn't go that Sunday, he could never have raced. And fog came in on Dublin Airport. And um, the pilot of the plane to pick him up, unfortunately the plane was coming from London and it landed in Liverpool. It came to Dublin, it circled twice, and it couldn't land. And I was being kept informed exactly what was happening. And um, I remember walking across the path from my house to the yard and thinking most people said the whole thing was madness anyway. And everybody said it was, you know, it was going to be a waste of money, it was ridiculous, it had never been done before, and it just, that was it. Yeah. And I was very relaxed about it because I said, you know, this might be just as well, this, this plane can't land because maybe everybody's right, maybe this is stupid, this can't be done. It'll save money, it'll save an awful lot of hassle, a lot of pressure, and we look at it some other time. And then I got a phone call on the old mobile phone telling me the pilot had made one last effort and he'd got in. And it was as, it was as tight as that. But these are things that happen in life in, in, and of course the rest is history. You got down to, to Melbourne and, and the day itself. Hmm. Was there any part of you that, that thought, I can't actually believe we're doing this? Because it's not something that people had hitherto considered essentially, was it? 
Yeah, in Australia, of course, most people thought it was ludicrous as well because the horse hadn't run since he'd won yeah. the Irish St. Ledger. Uh, in those days, a horse had to run basically on the Saturday before the race to be fit. And um, I had been very happy with his preparation, but uh, maybe he had gone under the radar a little bit because uh, his times, they hadn't, he hadn't clocked fast times, which I didn't want. But he, he went off at 28 to 1. And, uh, but I was very happy with him, and we just got him right just close to the race. I was just happy. Initially, he was a little bit dehydrated, and took him, it took him a while to get over the flight. But close to the race, I was very happy with the horse. A, a, a very special, very, very special horse for, for you. And, and he I. was. He was an amazing, amazing, amazing tough horse mentally as well as physically. He was, he was just a real, real good... He was the classic of what I call stare with speed. He was ideally mile and a half, mile and six horse, rather than a two mile horse, because he came, I'd always wanted to win the Gold Cup with him, and of course he ran second in the Gold Cup at Royal Ascot. He just didn't get the trip, the extra, the extra half mile. But even two miles was too far for him. He was really a mile and six horse, and that's why he won two St. Ledger's for me. Is it easy to identify mental toughness in a horse when you, you first take a, take a look at them, when they first do something for you? No, I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's easy. I think it comes as you get to know your horse and you get because you get surprises. And the ones you think may not be tough turn out to be the ones. Mm -hmm. um, look, I won with a group filly yesterday called Tarnawa. And uh, that was her second group race and she's very consistent. And in her initial stages of being tough, I wouldn't have accused her of being tough. Talented, yes, but not tough. But she's matured and developed and now she has a toughness to her. And that's one of the qualities you showed yesterday. Can you, can you train that into a horse or is it just innate? I think you can train it into them. I think you build confidence in them. I think it's all about confidence. You were confident enough to go to Melbourne and, and win with, with Vintage Crop, but in essence, your second Melbourne Cup victory with Media Puzzle was more, was more resonant, and certainly more resonant in, yeah. in Australia. Just remind me why. Well, the main reason was because of the rider, of course. And losing his brother uh, the week before, there was a big doubt whether Damien Oliver would ride the horse or not. And even when I landed in Australia, there was a bevy of the press wanted to know who was going to ride the horse. And um, I said, let's wait and see. It, it'll be Damien's decision. I've, I've made no jockey. They named a number of jockeys that were available. In fact, there he's just beating Vinnie Rowe because that for me was even more enjoyable because turning for home in that year's Melbourne Cup, um, I was pretty certain it was either going to be Vinnie Rowe or Media Puzzle mm -hmm. was going to win. And Vinnie Rowe was the best horse I trained that didn't win the Melbourne Cup. He was second, of course, to Machiavi Diva, yeah. trying to give her weight. Which is, yeah, pretty much impossible. You know, and he was a great stare, Vinnie Rowe, and he won four back-to-back -back Irish St. Ledgers from me. But it was Media Puzzle's day, and uh, it was a great day. And uh, uh, an ex extraordinarily special day for, for Damien Oliver and a poignant day for, for his family, as you were saying, and they made a movie out of the, yeah. out of the story. With, yeah. who, who, remind me, Brendan Gleeson Brendan played Brendan Gleeson played me, and Brendan, I think, did it very well. Um, he came down, he spent a couple of days with us, and uh, yeah, the movie went very good. It was uh, shown uh, for quite a long while. It used to be shown on, on different airlines for about a year, and I get a lot of comments and emails and things, but overall, I thought, considering the budget they had, it was a good job. Did you quite enjoy that, the I idea did. of a, a bit of an A-lister playing you in a uh, movie? Who wouldn't, let's face yeah, it, exactly. who wouldn't? Exactly, I thought it was nice, I, I thought it was nice, I, I enjoyed it, um, I equally enjoyed it, I was fortunate, I wrote a book on uh, Vintage Crop, uh, Vintage Crop Against All Odds, and got that got to be num number five in the non-fiction list in Ireland, so I was proud of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, is, is writing something that you'd like to have done more of had time allowed you? Yes, it is. Uh, when I was at school, I, I, I won an All-Ireland Essay writing competition, and uh, I've always liked to write, but I never... That was the only time I've taken time, and I actually wrote that book longhand, <laughs> believe it or not, and um, Alex Ferguson wrote the foreword to it, and uh, yeah, I've, I, I enjoy doing it. You have, I, I, I know your, your son's a, a terrific singer, and uh, you've obviously oh, got quite goodness. an artistic streak running through the family. Oh, well, Mark's a beautiful voice and, and, and is a lovely singer, yes, indeed. And Chris is very gifted as well. And, and is that something that goes back through the, through the generations? Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. My, my, my father uh, had a lovely voice and was a lovely pianist. 
I ask the question because it, it strikes me that you've you've gone and succeeded on a lot of big stages in in countries where if you get a big race there's quite a bit of razzmatazz quite a bit of showbiz sure. attached yeah. to it perhaps more than there is in Ireland or or, yeah. or in England is that something that appeals to you quite a bit that the show the theatre of, of horse racing I'm not so sure I just think from a very young young age when I went around the world that I saw the opportunities that mm. were there rather than in Ireland competition is very keen and it's always been so keen and I had to take on at a very young age Vincent O'Brien who is the greatest <laughs> trainer of all times and another wonderful trainer called Paddy Prendergast yeah. that was three times champion trainer of England training from Ireland and I had to take those two men on and I thought very quickly I learned there's a lot easier opportunities around the world than taking these two brilliant trainers on. I think it came from that, really. Let's just pause then to consider just how good those two men were and how they shaped the game. How did yeah. they shape the game? Well, Vincent O'Brien, his record speaks for itself, from National Hunt to Flat to the Derbys he won, and, Vin and Paddy Prendigas, brilliant trainer of sprinters. And uh, as I said, uh, if you wanted to take those men on, uh, you had to be at your very best. What would horse racing in Ireland, what would horse racing in Europe, global horse racing even, look like without the influence of Vincent O'Brien now, do you think? Oh, I think it would look very different because if you look at the way the, the stallions of the world, you, you know what I mean, look at Northern Dancer, look at all that line, how, how he identified uh, that bloodlines uh, and look what's happened. Northern Dancer, a uh, winner of the Kentucky Derby, who had such a, an enormous influence himself, mm. uh, bred, bred in Canada and uh, you were the first and remain the only European trainer to have won an American Triple Crown race in 1990, 19, yeah. was it, 1990, yeah, it was. Going, going yeah. in, the, yeah. in, in the Belmonts. Yeah. I mean, that is pretty insane now. <laughs> Never mind then. Yeah, well, when I worked in America, I worked for a great vet called William Reed, and one year I was there. I started working to put myself through college. I was going to America from the age of about 17, working the back stretches. And uh, so I watched probably two Belmonts because during the summer holidays, mm -hmm. and that's when I was working. And I watched two Belmonts, and of course, then, like when I was in Australia, I always said I'd bring a horse back to win the Melbourne Cup, and everybody laughed at it. And I said, you know, I saw how big a how big a deal the Belmont. You must remember is the it's the biggest day's racing on the east coast of the United States mm -hmm. to this day. And uh, I saw, you know, in those days, 130,000 people at the Belmont, you know, and I said, you know, God, I'd love to have a horse someday to come and race in this great race. And uh, you only appreciate it when you're there. So that was always in my mind. And um, as I said, that basically is how Go and Go came along to win the Belmont. Now, there's an awful lot went into it. And uh, he won as a two-year-old in Galway, which you always have to have a horse that's tough and genuine. And then he won his stakes race for me. And um, then I saw, I thought I'd bring him to America. And you always need, you need luck, if I can <laughs> fun. And we, I found a race for him at Laurel Park on the turf, a grade one. And I decided we'd have a crack at that. And uh, I got the support of his wonderful owner, Mr. Hafner, my Glare Stud, yep. who has been such a huge supporter of the entire family of me all my life. And, um, we decided we'd have a crack at it. And um, on the day it rained, and of course the race was taken off the turf and ran in the dirt. And he won the grade one two-year-old race. And I actually think he became the first European two-year-old to win a grade one on the dirt. And that's how it happened. And then we sent him on down to Miami yeah, for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, which of course was run in the dirt. I think he ran third in that. He ran very well. And of course, after that, the winter then was all planned. And I found it very difficult to get to run in the Kentucky Derby. Was not on in those days for him. Certainly coming from Ireland, I didn't think it could be done with the quarantine in those days. So the Belmont, of course, was the race I'd always wanted. So he was prepared completely to run the Belmont. And he ran the, fa the seventh fastest Belmont. And another brilliant ride from Michael Kinnan. Tell me a little bit about Michael Kinnan as a, as a rider. Well, I think Michael, I was very fortunate. I've had two wonderful riders, Michael Kinnan, for 14 years and Pat Smuller for 17 years. So, uh, as my second son Chris said, I've been spoiled when it comes <laughs> to riders. And after having a great rider in Wally Swinburne for a year or two before that. But uh, Michael was the professional's professional. 
And uh, highly, in I've always said, I'm quoted as saying that he'd been a success in any business that he went into. He just happened to be a jockey. Do you find it easy to get on with, with jockeys? That, that, that suggests you do, but what's the reality? <laughs> that suggests I do. Possibly not. <laughs> um, as I said, 30 years with just two riders uh, says it is, but I was so fortunate in having and realizing the talent that I had. So it's hard for those coming forward nowadays uh, to replicate it. Does it mean you're harder on them now? No. Because you've no, I had suppose. such brilliant ones. Yeah, I suppose I am. Yeah, I don't have the same patience maybe that, that like, uh, they were so professional, both Michael and, and Pat, that they had analyzed each race. And it wasn't, it wasn't a question of giving instructions to how they'd ride that race. You know, they had in their own minds, in their research, they had gone through that race in detail. There was no need for me to tell them. And of course, they were very good stable jockeys, and this is what I like. They knew their horses. I mean, stable jockeys, they, were, they worked five days a week, every morning, before they ever went racing. Mm -hmm. So they knew each and every one of my horses. And uh, they knew exactly what to do. How, how proud are you of of Pat Smullen and the way that he's in, inspired people and conducted himself in the last year or so. He sat in that chair only, only a couple yeah. of months back. Yeah, it's, it's what I expected. Um, Pat is, is just a class act and a wonderful person and a huge example to people that, that suffer from cancer. And how he's handled his health and his illness is uh, an example to everybody. And a completely committed pro in the, in the saddle. Uh, as we saw on on Derby Day, yes, indeed. Yes, give you indeed. the give you the Derby with yeah, with, with Haas and which, yeah. if you'd got to the end of your career without a Derby win, would it have felt like a big would it have felt like a bigger mission? Yes, it would have. I've been very fortunate. I've trained twenty four European Classic winners, and uh, I had trained twenty three, and I hadn't won the Derby. Yeah, and it would have been an mission. Yes, I wanted to win it, and very fortunate to have the horse and and. Uh, here he comes here with a brilliant ride from Pat, and of course then he went on and won the Irish Derby as well a couple of weeks later. But he, Harazan is a seriously good, tough horse, and a horse I believe would make a stallion. He's a beautifully bred horse, we see the stars, out of a great staying family. But he was a stare with speed again. It's hard to say that he didn't get, get the rub of the green given the fact that he won the Derby and the Irish Derby. Sure. But do you think, do you think in time, history will judge him slightly better. I've no doubt of it because he was unbeaten at that stage. He had won his maiden by 14 lengths. He'd won his group three at Leperstown, a good group three over 10 furlongs. He went then to Epsom. He won the Epsom Derby. Then he went to the Curry and won the Irish Derby. And then he went to the Irish Champion Stakes. And he got badly struck into after going a furlong in the Irish Champion Stakes. And he carries the wound to this day. Is that right? Yeah, it's very interesting. You can see on his hind joint, you can see the white hairs, you can see the scars that he had that day when he came in lame after running in the Irish Champion Stakes. But that was a very special day at Epsom for me, for us all. And Her Majesty, of course, was there to present the trophies. And we had a very enjoyable meeting with her afterwards. A lot of people have described their meetings with, uh, with Her Majesty the Queen and uh, mm. talk about her, her knowledge of the sport. Mm. The Derby, of course, Rather like you, it's the race that she, she wants, she's after, she's craving. And True indeed. Well, she's, she's also been such a huge influence on the breeding industry and, and you're so fortunate to have such a wonderful monarch. We were talking about the, the breeding industry extensively, as I'm sure you saw before, yes, and the, yeah. the bloodstock review that's taking place mm -hmm. at the moment in, in Ireland, England. Henry Beebe, Goff's chief executive, mentioned your name several times. I'm sure Dermot <laughs> Well will say this, he said, I'm sure he'll say that. So, Look, it's, it's, what, uh, is your what is your thought on the regulator trying to get a little more involved and to tighten up Well, look, I think practice? going forward, I think the new code of practice is a good idea. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of new breeders coming into the business. I think there's a lot of new young agents. And hopefully we can attract a lot more new people to come in to buy horses. And I think the new code of practice will give confidence. I don't want to go into the details, no point going into the past whether it was rights or wrongs. But I think going forward is all that matters. I think the code of practice will give confidence and trust. Mm. That's what I believe in. And you've trained for a lot of international owners and people sure. who've come into the game. Yes, indeed. Not late in life, but it's not their first love. True, so true you, indeed. So how, how do you 
take them by the hand, if you like, and say, look, I know you want to spend millions of pounds here, but I've got to help you spend millions of pounds, well, if it's possible, judiciously. I think that they, you've got to show them, and they probably wouldn't come to you anyway unless they have confidence and trust in you. And that's why I think the code of practice will be good going forward. And you show them, we, we, we will use an agent, what the agent fee will be. It'll be it's actually usually a 3 or 5% and everything, the clarity, and keep it simple and keep it clear. Mm. So that everybody knows exactly where yes, they stand. Yes, there should be no confusion whatsoever. But going forward, and we do, do need more new people to come to buy horses, and I believe we will. So I do think that going forward it is positive. I mean, evidently, there's a one huge, huge ownership contingent in, in Ireland, in the, in the yes. Coolmore uh, Triumvirate. Is it, does that make it more difficult for a trainer like you, for example, to get yeah. new money into Ireland to compete against Yeah, against definitely, them? it does. <clears throat> it definitely does, but it equally means that I've got to raise my standard of training if I want to compete and maintain my level that I want to compete not only in Ireland but around the world. So if Vincent O'Brien was the, the man who really set the standard mm -hmm, for, for, for trainers in Europe and the world, what impact on you, for example, who predate him by 25, 30 years, has Aidan O'Brien had? Huge. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been, I don't know what, nine times champion trainer of Ireland and 18 times in numbers of winners trained. And but and for him, <laughs> and you could have put a one in front of that. I think since Aidan started training for Coolmore on a major scale, I've only been champion trainer once during those, whatever it is, 20 years. So that, that answers the question. Right, so is it, is it frustrating or motivating, or both? Both. <laughs> but that's it. If you, no matter what way you think about it, it is both frustrating and it is motivating. So how do you go about business? Well, yesterday there was a six-runner group race. We bring things right up, up to date. Mm -hmm. Aiden ran four. He the favourite, the second favourite. And uh, we won. So, you know, it, it certainly can be done. Give you a, does it give you a little extra, little extra kick? It does. It does. But I have, it does because I have the highest regard and respect for their talents. Mm. And what is it about him personally, do you think, that has made him what he is? Not in terms of the material that he gets, but in terms of his own inner, inner being. I suppose to, to succeed in this very, very tough business that we're in, you've got to have huge determination, confidence, work rate, and that's what he's got. Brilliance. He said quite famously in an interview not so long ago that just racing is his life. It yeah. just consumes yeah. every bit of him all the time. He doesn't have downtime really or relaxation. His relaxation is consi to consider the next step of, of, of building his, yeah. his empire. It strikes me you're slightly different to that. I am. I am. That I probably from all my travels around the world, uh, I've learned to see life differently. I realise how short life is. How much we must enjoy our lives. As I said, I enjoy writing, uh, I enjoy poetry, I enjoy oh, a lot of things of life, you know what I mean? So it's, um, I just see how short life is. Can you turn it off? Can you turn off Zermatt World, the trainer? I think I can. When yes, you shut the door at night? I do indeed, I do indeed, most definitely. So you don't worry excessively about where's this going to run, What's on, what am I going to do with that? You don't lie awake at night thinking? No, I don't, but I'd be very sharp come <laughs> seven o'clock in the morning in my subconscious what horses I'm going to work will be flashing through my mind already. And is it, is it, the, is it the love for the game or is it, the, is it just this huge competitiveness that, that still drives you? I suppose it's the competitiveness that, that drives you to do it, if you know what I mean. And, and the, you know, it's, it's the pleasure that you get out of completing somebody, something successfully that you put a lot of effort, a lot of thought, a lot of work into. Mm. And again, I, I speak to many people who sit in this chair and they've had great success, sure. but I always wonder whether they enjoy it very much. I get the feeling with you, you really do enjoy it. I like, certainly you know do. how to enjoy life, you know how to <laughs> get a kick out do. of it. I certainly do, because just saying, being so fortunate to have spent a year changing the world of racing to win the Melbourne Cup. The amount of work and effort went into that, and that was huge. And I got a huge pleasure and enjoyment out of that. Or winning Belmont, or winning 
we went to Hong Kong with two horses in the early days in the very start of the international mm -hmm. series and we were first and second and um, we set a track record I remember with additional risk for Hong Kong and uh, hence I, I kind of remember these things because it was very special and huge enjoyment of the success I'm very proud of being Irish I'm very proud of being able to do it for Ireland as mm -hmm. well if you know what I mean because going through different phases, economic recessions and things like this, especially when, when Vintage Crop won in the early 90s, uh, that was huge for sport for Ireland, you know what I mean? I was very fortunate with the awards I got and things, but that was irrelevant because it was just for my country to, on the world stage, uh, to win these major races, be it Australia, be it America, be it in anywhere, Hong Kong. Do you think that's something we'd sort of take for granted a little bit now? Because, because Cool, yeah, we do. so massive and so powerful and you, the, the, yeah. the stallion enterprise well, is so big and sure. well, big times change, there. times moves on if you know what I mean and uh, we tend to take it a little bit but with globalization, with modern technology it's not seen as such a big thing. Uh, in those days in the 90s which is not that long ago when I was doing these things it was huge because uh, transportation wasn't the same, media communications were not the same. You know, mobile cell phones weren't the same. Mm. world has changed dramatically over the last 25 years. And again, people who've had 40-year, mm. more, more than 40-year careers, it's, it's quite rare that they'd say, oh, it's great now, it's better now than it was then. No, I don't think so. No, I had a feeling you'd say that. No, 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 I don't think it's better now. I think it's always been good. Yeah. If you could have one of those days over again, which would it be? That's a very, very hard question because every win, even that group win yesterday, was hugely satisfying, hugely committed, a lot of work went into it, a very, very satisfying day. So every win, even a, every small win to me is important, but you'd have to say because of the sheer effort, determination and work went into the first Melbourne Cup win, mm. it'd have to be vintage crop. Must have been an amazing moment. It's changed the shape of the of the entire race for, for for decades to come. In addition to being played in a film by by Brendan Gleeson, I would I would conjecture that your other most unusual accomplishment was Paddy Power trying to, well, what, with, through one of their stunts, change the name of the uh, the Galway Festival to the Dermot World Retirement Festival. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that, yeah, that that and again is a, is, a, is a kind of crazy compliment that uh, well, that you must have got a bit of bit of yeah, kick out of. In my early days, training Galway was very very important to me, and my late father trained the winner of the Galway Plate. So from a very very early age, I was very much interested in Galway. It came at a good time of year, but. As I said, in my early days, there was very little prize money in Ireland, and the Galway Festival was a big gambling, and I trained for Irish owners, and most of them gambled, and that was, if they wanted to earn the keep for the year, that's where you had to deliver the goods, and if you're going to be a good trainer, you had to know how to land a gamble in mm. Galway, and if you did, well, you'd get a lot more horses, and that's what helped to make me, and I was leading trainer, whatever it was, 29 times in Galway, we were very fortunate a number of years ago. We actually had 17 winners at, at one meeting from about 28 runners. But times change, and I have I change a much smaller team of horses by design nowadays. I have other targets than Galway. I still enjoy it very much. But as you see, uh, Willie Mullins has replaced me as leading trainer there. And there's a lot more national hunt racing in Galway now than there used to be and I've reduced my national hunt team to practically zero. Why? I enjoyed it very much. I think now with flat racing going the whole year round, we race in Dundalk throughout the winter. We have Saudi Arabia maybe coming on stream. I go to Dubai with horses. It's a, it's a changing world. I also think that I would only want to and always ever did. I was been fortunate I've trained three grade one Cheltenham winners. Mm. That if I want to keep doing that, I only want the best and you've got to have the funding behind you to do that, and I don't. So that's basically the reason, you know, being up front. But I think, uh, I think there's enough for you to get excited about through the, next, uh, through the next weeks and years. You're still ambitious and driven as ever. Oh yes, very much so. No, I'm very fortunate and I've trained for some wonderful owners, and we've got some nice young horses coming forward. I know you're staying with us, but for the moment, Dermot Weld, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me, Nick. Appreciate it.